Okay, in this video, we're picking up where we left off last time, which was uh, roughly at the bottom of page 62 in our book. And if you recall, we had just gone through the process of scaffolding and looking through these interfaces right here. And then we had a real brief little discussion about the types of scaffolding that are available uh, from the drop-down menu and what happens, uh, in essence, when you choose those different approaches. Generally speaking, when you have a fully built application that is being driven by a data model, you will very often selectively choose uh, certain CRUD operations or all of them. And that's a very common thing to do in these types of application builds. All right. But the topic that we're going to focus on uh, this evening uh, for the rest of Chapter 3 is uh, talking about the Razor View Engine. And I think we just brushed upon it very, very quickly uh, last time we talked and didn't really get into uh, anything of substance. Uh, Razor is a tool that was introduced to ASP.NET MVC uh, back with version 3. And it's a, an important tool very simply because it helps us to simplify the language that we use to do output to the browser. And there's some very distinct advantages to it. Uh, rather than using kind of the old-fashioned approach where we kind of like switch, uh, like we do with PHP, for example, where we switch between PHP and HTML, and you got to like open and close your tags, it, and it kind of messes you up a little bit. Uh, somebody came up with this thought that that's not a very efficient way to do it. Why don't we come up with a different tool that basically allows us to do the same thing without having to like open and close tags and forget and, and screwing things up. So what they came up with was this thing called uh, Razor. And of course, Razor has its very own type of syntax. Uh, and the Razor syntax is going to always be, uh, you know, preceded by using an at symbol to indicate that you're using Razor syntax. One of the things that's kind of uh, fun about it is that fact that I don't have to put in those ASP style tags where we go, you know, bracket, percent sign, do your ASP code, and then switch it back. So notice what happens here is I just put in the at sign, run the code that I run, which uh, is like its own special type of syntax. That's just a different syntax to learn here. And then I just drop my HTML right in into the mix. And it's pretty easy to figure out what is going on here if you've had any experience with programming. And what they're saying is they're running a, a for loop, and it's a for each loop. So it goes through whatever your structure is and methodically steps through it and then pulls it in and drops it into uh, the list item. And notice, even within the list item here, how they have a razor directive that actually reads the item in and drops it into place without having, once again, to put the ASP tags into the mix. So it's, it's a way of significantly simplifying the syntax for doing uh, HTML output. So whenever you see that, that at sign thrown in, that's an indicator to you that we're working with Razor. And if you want to compare between the two different approaches, uh, take a look at what we have here. So this is really a nice little example. Um, and in some ways, maybe that would have been a better example to show to start with. But notice here, um, if we were to do it the old-fashioned way, we would throw in an H1 in our HTML, some text, and then we would then turn on the ASP-style delimiters. You know, so bracket, percent sign, then whatever little tool that goes with. And then inside there, you're running the code that goes with the scripting language that you're using. In this case, it would be asp Net. And then, of course, you have to close that out before you can return back to your HTML. And the thing that would mess people up is they would forget sometimes to put those in or they would put the wrong ones in. And if you're, you know, let's say an experienced PHP programmer, making the transition isn't that bad. Uh, but if you've never done that language, boy, that really, really messes you up, you know, getting used to that format. So the, the replacement is very simply just throwing in the Razor directive and the code that you're using. So how much cleaner is that? Much cleaner, easier to read, screws you up much less, 
and uh, really is uh, kind of the preferred way to do things. Does that mean you have to do it that way? No, you do not have to do it that way, but it is certainly a, uh, a preference. The other thing that you might want to look at here is when you are working with uh, Razor directives, you can actually set up things that are, uh, for example, variables that you can reuse in your code. So here at the top, I've highlighted a little example that you might see at the top of one of your files, one of your HTML or your template files, uh, where they're actually setting up a variable and storing a value inside that variable. And then in the remainder of the application, they can just simply refer to that variable to pull in the information that you need right within the Razor directive. So yes, you can create variables and you can feed that data across um, your application. You can also do things by actually wrapping things into parentheses. It's just kind of very much situationally dependent uh, at what point you're going to do that. And then, you know, you also have this question and, you know, I typically will get this from students. Well, what if, what if I have an email address in there? Well, folks, Visual Studio is smart enough to figure out that it's an email address. And, and really what separates it is the fact that uh, it is a continuous string and not a space preceding the at sign. That's kind of the thing that uh, makes it an email address. Now, if you, of course, mistakenly put an at sign in there, yeah, it's going to try to parse it as Razor. Um, but it should recognize that it's the wrong thing, and the IntelliSense hopefully will kick in and help you. Um, all right. Another thing that you can do with Razor uh, Notice is that you can actually put two at signs in if you need to escape it. So what if, what if you actually want to put an at sign on your page, right? So how would you do that? Well, you could use really the, the special character code that comes with HTML to do it. That would really be the smart way to do it. But some people forget about it. So if, if you do need to have that symbol in there, uh, for example, if you're writing a web page that talks about Razor, how do you get the at sign in there? If you're using Razor, you put an extra at sign before it. So it's an escape symbol. They do go through a couple of examples here, which I'll let you read through on uh, your own. That's absolutely fine. Um, but you need to uh, be aware of those things. Uh, and here's an example of escaping it, um, for example. All right, let's talk now about HTML encoding real quick. And HTML encoding is basically a, a tool that we use um, to adjust things to become HTML so that when we do output to the browser, it reads correctly and renders properly uh, for the user. So one thing that would always be a problem in the real old days of uh, Web 2.0, and that is when we start doing websites where users were able to interact with the website and post content. And, you know, I think of like a classic scenario would be like a blog, right? So somebody makes a blog entry, and then you as a user who views the blog would have the ability to comment, right? Or, uh, you know, add something to it. And you get a little form and you get a little button that allows you to post it. Well, one thing that uh, programmers figured out or hackers figured out real early on that, you know what, if I drop code into that box instead of dropping like what I want to say, I can actually do some malicious things, some fun things maybe in, in the mind of a hacker, but you can actually kind of take control of a site or do things that aren't really intended. So what people would do is they would actually for example, drop in a script with script tags around it. And what happens? It tries to execute because that's what browsers do. So what they've come up with is this HTML encoding, which helps to prevent that from happening uh, by, the, by virtue of using uh, Razor as kind of like the front end to prevent it. So um, it's kind of a clever little approach. And then what happens is if you take something like this, and try to feed it into a form, the HTML encoding in this engine that we're using will basically convert it to all the special character codes that would prevent it from actually executing it as a script, but would still be read as text and converted to text. So then the hacker who thought it was clever, it was triggering the script, is actually just sending that code right to a comment window and it's not doing anything. 
And it took people a while to figure out how to prevent that from happening, but that was a real early hacking trick. And there are websites out there still, folks, that you can do this to, um, but any like major content management system has been protecting this for a good decade or so now. So the only ones that you see that are an exception are the ones that are really uh, old. So one, one technique that you might often see uh, is, for example, even if somebody is trying to like just add like bold to their text that um, we put in the HTML encoding razor symbol to help read that message in and basically get rid of that extra junk, okay? So that it comes out um, in the way that's intended, not hurting anything, basically. All right, so cross-site scripting vulnerabilities aside, um, let's take a look at this little uh, function here and you guys should recognize real quickly that we're using uh, some JavaScript and actually whenever you see the dollar sign of course you're actually using what? Anybody take a JavaScript class in here? Yeah. What, what does a dollar sign signify when you're using JavaScript? That you're actually using jQuery which is a JavaScript library. So that's that's how you see dollar signs here. Now the book just kind of makes an, an assumption that you guys are kind of familiar with that, but JavaScript and jQuery can be intermingled uh, very seamlessly. But whenever you see a dollar sign intermingled with JavaScript, that implies you're using the jQuery libraries as a shortcut. So um, one of the things that you see that they're doing here is that you can actually intermingle your Razor stuff right inside of your JavaScript. That's really darn cool, right? So not only can you intermingle it with your HTML, but you can also intermingle it with your JavaScript, uh, which is a very useful little uh, feature. All right. All right, let's look at some syntax, additional syntax here for um, working with uh, Razor and how it lays out. So we looked at an example above that uh, is basically like this little for each loop that we're looking at right now with the Razor directives uh, in place. What's fascinating about this technology is that it does allow us actually to, to put things in slightly different formats. But I like to use this comparison um, really, and this is a nice comparison here. Right? You know, the ability for us to change from this approach Notice the ASP style tag delimiters where we have to wrap it around the curly braces, put in our HTML, do more you know, ASP style tags, and then just add a couple of the ASP tags just to close out your curly brackets. I mean, that is kind of a, like obnoxious, really. You know, but that is how intermingled languages work because otherwise it will parse as HTML and not parse as whatever language you're trying to make it. So this approach that you see, either this layout or this layout, I mean, it's basically the same thing, um, is a lot cleaner and a lot simpler to use. And I really don't want to add too much more to it aside from that um, because that's really kind of the crux of it, um, one of the major advantages of doing it. Notice also uh, that with Razor, when you, you set up uh, these particular uh, variables in, in a little code block, and then you can pull it in um, and use it. Now, one of the things that you guys will notice that there's uh, this HTML encoding stuff will often be prefaced with a little HTML moniker so that you know that it's doing HTML encoding. So in other words, what that really means as an overview is that whatever tool you're running it's doing whatever it's doing with Razor and then turning it into the right HTML format for you. Now some of it you'll you'll say to yourself as you're working with it, because I know I do, it's like, why do I why am I even bothering to do this in Razor? I can just do it in straight HTML. And you know what? As a programmer, you'd really have that choice. One of the advantages to sticking with Razor for doing all the view output is that you have programmatic control over it. And if you set up variables and things, you can actually get it to um, like replace a whole bunch of things at once by changing the value of one variable. If that's not really an issue, you can actually stick with traditional HTML output if that's better for you. There's really no rule. 
Um, but I think that what's a better practice is if you're doing razor output, do razor output and stick with it. That, that's kind of my mindset. Um, but there are no rules. All right, so some of the, uh, the examples that they have here, and they're not really too long-winded, just to show you kind of what it looks like, um, is where you might see uh, something like this. So you might have a little tag, and then you might be throwing in a little directive. Now, of course, message is probably something that you're setting as a variable, and then model is something that's predefined up above with uh, your razor expressions. Can I run code on the fly with a razor? Absolutely you can. So you can actually do math. HTML doesn't do the math, does it? So like here, the 1 plus 2 on the left side of the equal sign is just text. On the other side, it's actually computing it and putting the answer on the screen. So you see the difference there. And chances are you can probably guess at the syntax of what Razor is doing very often. Of course, you will need a reference when you're doing some of the HTML encoding. So for example, I wouldn't expect you to memorize HTML raw, but really what that's going to do is it's going to um, convert whatever stuff that you've put in just into straight HTML without altering it. All right. I think we saw enough examples of like combining text and markup and how much cleaner it is. Um, without a doubt, it is a better approach. Um, we already talked about the double ampersand. And then, it, oh, here's a good one. If you want to put in a comment, how do you do a comment in Razor? And, and I ran into this issue with a student once. Uh, and it's kind of surprising because I would think that, you know, you'd probably find some other way if you couldn't figure out how to do it in Razor. But there is a way in Razor to do comments, and you just do ampersand star and then star ampersand to encapsulate it. It's kind of quirky, but, um, you know, the reason it's kind of quirky is, like, because you're working in an HTML document usually, you can also use HTML comments to do your comments. You don't have to do it in Razor. So that that's kind of why... You know, I, I, I kind of wonder about that one a little bit. All right. Where you're going to see uh, Razor used a lot is in dynamic environments. So, for example, we might have like a template or a master page, right, uh, in .NET that we have. And we want, let's say, the title to populate automatically, which is the example that you see here. And it doesn't make sense to have to code a different master page for every page you put up, right? You should have it dynamically respond. And one of the things that's neat about Razor is the fact that we can feed variables into it for some of this content. So we can push the title in, and then we can push it onto the page content as well. And it's not unusual when you're doing uh, Razor work to basically have like a template like this, right? So like the whole site basically works off of this template. Right? And all that we're feeding into it is the title. We put an H1 on the page, it shows the title of the page. And then we're also rendering the body. And what this does is it's just, you, you see it's a method because it's got parentheses after it. It's just a function that goes out and says, well, if the title is about, give me the about page body content. Right? So when you write in a separate document the body of the page for about page, you're just pulling in that stuff and you're inserting it into this spot. So like if you're comparing to PHP, it would be like an include to bring the whole content section of a page in. So that's a pretty normal type of thing to do, just to make your work a little bit easier. Another thing that you can uh, designate, um, because you are often working with these uh, CSHTML files, which themselves are templates, you know, all being dynamically stitched together, uh, you will often see something like this at the top of your, your Razor uh, pages or HTML pages using Razor, and that is which layout are you using to render this page? What structure are we feeding into? Also, um, what's the title? And whatever other dynamic things that you put in. So if we were for example, to throw this directive in there, uh, it would 
populate these two areas. So the output would look like this. You'd see the index, both in the little tab for your title. The H1 also received it. And then if the whole page contents is just a paragraph, whatever the whole page content in would just squeeze into that div and populate to the page. Pretty simplistic, but uh, pretty powerful. Of course, you can add those render body. You can also render a section. So, for example, if we have just a footer, we can render that footer. And they give a couple examples of how that works uh, down here. Right. You can also do some clever things with Razor that you can't do uh, necessarily with straight ASP.NET without some adjustments, right? And that is to basically have it dynamically respond. So what if, you know, a user clicks one thing, then you might give them one uh, footer. If they click something else, you give them a different footer. And that might just be, are they logged in or are they not logged in? You know, just, just uh, food for thought. All right. Uh, another thing that you'll see is that there is this special type of uh, you know, page called a view start page. And I want you to notice right at the top of page 73 here that whenever we see uh, a CSHTML page or even an HTML page in this format, we see it being previewed with an underscore. The underscore is an indicator that this is a partial view. It's not the entire thing that makes up the page, just a portion of it. So that seems kind of weird because, you know, you're, you guys are kind of like trained to think, right, that you have a master page and certain stuff just repeats, and then I have my content area, right? But what if each part of the master page has sections that are also dynamic. So we just use the example of the footer or the header. Chances are, like, if you went to Amazon.com right now, and if you're like me, then you shop there, you'll probably just log in and it'll recognize who you are and have all the stuff in your shopping cart you already went through, right? So they have kind of a structure that's preset that dynamically generates content just for you. And it might even give you a different menu layout depending on what you do most often. In fact, I know for a fact it does on Amazon.com. So really what you're seeing here is that you can actually create little partials that you can pull in that have a basic structure, but yet dynamically respond. And so they're part of the view, so they're a partial view that helps to make up the whole view. And they're designated with that underscore. For me, that's probably one of the most uh, important takeaways so if you're going to speci specify a partial view, they do actually uh, come up with techniques for doing it. So for, they have a simple example here where they have a home controller, and then they have uh, basically a little snippet of text that they're throwing in, and then it returns the partial view um, because that's what they're calling it, basically. Uh, it, does, it will not draw the whole page, just the part of the page that you're designating. And that's really the, the important takeaway there. One thing that you're going to see often um, when you're working with Razor is this thing called the view bag. And that's going to be best seen, I think, as we're doing it. But whenever you see that view bag directive, that's kind of like a container. And I don't know why they came up with that name. Like, like you know, who, who was in charge of that project that came up with that name? But that's the name. And the view bag is like all the stuff that you're going to stick into this view, whether it's a partial or a whole view or whatever it is, you're putting it into the view bag. And then the view bag's job is to put it, you know, transport it to the browser and turn it into whatever it needs to be so the user can see it. So that'll usually be done dynamically. You'll always see it preceded with, with this directive, followed by a method or a variable or a model or, 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 or. There's so many different things you can put in there. But the view bag is kind of the thing that holds it all. All right. That's a, kind of the grand overview of views, a very quick view of Razor. Uh, like I said, most of this stuff we're going to kind of like figure out more detail on it as we go. The one thing that you'll see here on this page, and this is the top of page 74, and this is the um, one of those uh, alternate 
or extra credit assignments that comes with Chapter 3. So if you choose to go through here and then try this out, which basically pulls in that whole music store app and shows you some of these uh, examples, uh, please feel free uh, to, to try it out. It's not really that hard, and it's a good way to pick up some extra credit if you're interested. I know that we don't have a formal assignment here for Chapter 3 because uh, this book doesn't have any like real formal steps in this chapter, which is why uh, when we're done with this particular chapter, we're switching modes and we're going to a separate uh, tutorial that I will present to you in a separate video. All right, and uh, don't forget to uh, read the summary here, and uh, please keep in mind that any of the stuff that you read in the chapter is potential to be uh, on a test or a quiz or an exam. In fact, count on it. All right, folks, uh, this video ends here, and from here we're going to move on to building uh, what we call our MVC sample apps in our tutorials, which will start to be presented in Unit 4.